Wonderful. Um, so I will just get on the, with the presentation. Um, this is um, the ERI Friedman Family Visiting Professionals Program. And I'm very happy to finally be able to, um, to give this presentation to you at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I will cover a broad topic of functional recovery. Um, but before that, I'd like to say a few words about ERI. I know you are um, uh, very active uh, with the organization, um, uh, but a little bit of, of history. Um, ERI was established in 1948, and it's the leading nonprofit members organization um, that connects professionals dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. Um, it, um, it does um, achieve its mission by advancing science and practice of earthquake engineering, improving the understanding and impact of earthquakes, and advocating for comprehensive and realistic measures for reducing harmful effects of earthquakes. Um, ERI um, is close to my heart because it can bring people together from different disciplines. Um, it, can, it, it provides learning uh, through uh, learning from earthquakes um, that are uh, happening through its members, but also disseminating information through webinars, peer reviewed journals, and best practices. And um, provides um, uh, emerging and established leaders with the tools and opportunities. Um, through committees and regional chapters and student chapters to make um, the case for earthquake resilience. Um, my, my history with ERI started uh, at the University of Buffalo where I did my graduate studies. And I became one of the people who established the, um, the uh, student chapter there sometime in the mid nineties. Um, and I got very involved uh, following my graduate studies because I found it to be a very dynamic and get things done organization. Uh, so I, I was um, honored to serve in the board of directors uh, for six years. And um, um, before that, uh, working very hard uh, with other colleagues to get started the New York Northeast chapter that has grown to be a very active um, chapter in an area that is not um, as seismically active as other areas in the world. Um, so as I said, um, I assume uh, you are, most of you are in the engineering, civil engineering field, uh, but uh, you would uh, get a lot of benefit by interacting with other members of ERI, which are geologists, seismologists, architects, planners, and um, they range from uh, practical practicing engineers to um, educators and academics, but as well as stakeholders and uh, building code um, developers. Um, some highlights that I wanted to share that, that you could consider getting involved with. CECI is uh, one of the uh, recent, uh, very uh, engaging, uh, committees. It's the School Earthquake Safety Initiative that promotes safe, safe buildings for school children via outreach, screening, education, and policy. These categories are sub-committees that you can get involved with. Um, it's a very nice uh, committee uh, and, and very dynamic groups in there. Um, then uh, another program that is the trademark of ERI, but has evolved over the years is the LFE or Learning from Earthquakes program. And um, it has been around since ERI started and has uh, a lot of different activities, including a program called VERT, which is learning a, a virtual earthquake re reconnaissance uh, program that activates quickly after an earthquake happens and collects data virtually and collects also what activities are happening through other organizations. And a program that is very close to my heart, I was uh, one of the people that conceived that program as uh, an activity that has become, I think, very exciting. 
it is the travel study program where we are revisiting how we learn from earthquakes. So the idea is that we visit with um, about 20 young professionals, um, graduate students or young practitioners. Um, we, we visit an earthquake site many years after an earthquake has happened to see what worked, what didn't work, stay there for a week and learn with um, uh, not only with uh, field trips, but also through actual experts and people who applied different technologies about these earthquakes of what worked and what didn't work. So this program has been um, in place uh, first in Chile and um, recently in New Zealand. Uh, this year due to COVID did not happen, uh, but it's usually international destinations with a combination of um, uh, local combination, uh, lo local locations. So uh, with your student membership, um, you get um, um, a lot of uh, access to a lot of different um, uh, things, including Earthquake Spectra, which is the top journal in publication for earthquake engineering. Very important, there are many opportunity opportunities for travel grants that can support your participation in our ERI annual meetings. And of course, competitions that happen every year in our uh, annual meeting. Um, and uh, that I think you're familiar with, exchange of knowledge and meeting professionals through this program, the Friedman program. And um, after you graduate, I think ERI does a very good job in retaining uh, this community from your student years to moving into your um, professional years um, where you can have, um, uh, a lot of activities that have to do with young members. And this is very, very important because for the first five years, I think after your graduation, you maintain your young member, young members um, uh, status. And um, you can be involved, of course, with uh, um, regional chapters. Uh, you can have uh, funding that could come from FEMA, NIHERP, and other resources for postgraduate um, support of your graduate studies, or even do an internship at ERI itself, and of course be part of this staff travel study program that I shared. Um, these are the existing um, chapters that are available and you can go to the website and look at regional chapters to get more, um, uh, more information. So uh, yes, it is five years and you get the reduced rate of membership. I think it's half of what you would pay for four years while your first year would be free. And that is an incentive to, um, to keep you um, engaged with the institute. So um, this was, um, I, I'd be happy to answer more and give you any advice I could give from my experiences on ERI membership and how you can take the most advantage of it and um, you know feel uh, rewarded. And uh, for me, I recently joined NIST uh, other than being an ERI member, my uh, everyday job is, is uh, being the earthquake engineering group leader of, uh, of NIST. And I will just say a couple of words about uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. In general, it is um, an institute that works under the Department of Commerce and um, it promotes innovation, innovation, but also industrial competitiveness by advancing science standard and technology uh, in ways that enhance the economic security and improve the quality of life of the nation. Um, uh, and um, it has been established by the um, the U.S. Constitution as a federal uh, function. It is. Um, it has about 2,400 2, employees, two main campuses, one in close to D.C. and the other one in Colorado. And um, uh, around NIST, there are five Nobel Prizes. 
um, a lot of collaborative institutes. And I know that uh, we are uh, actively doing uh, research work with your exceptional laboratory uh, facilities. Um, so I'm sure that you are um, familiar with um, uh, NIST. Uh, the work of NIST is available publicly and there have been significant studies of major events, including the understanding of the collapse of the, uh, of the towers at 9-11. And currently we are working on a lot of different aspects of the Hurricane Maria um, uh, her, uh, disaster, uh, some of which have already been um, uh, released and I would encourage you to look at them. Uh, the Earthquake Engineering Group program has um, uh, one part of it is supporting NIHERP, the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program uh, with collaborative projects or, or research that we do in house. And I wanted to emphasize that there are opportunities that your professors also can share uh, with you uh, for um, uh, internships, uh, also postdoctoral studies, and um, specific um, research appointments within NIST that I, I would be more than happy to, to discuss with you. So going into the actual uh, technical presentation, I will um, go through uh, some concepts about uh, resiliency and some new challenges and developments, especially related to functional recovery. And, um, I would love to discuss those uh, with you. So uh, 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 resiliency is a word that, you know, probably means different things to different people, even among us uh, as uh, civil engineers. Um, and uh, I, the, the concept of bouncing back uh, is what has been used uh, extensively from uh, the fields of psychology or economy as uh, something to describe resiliency. However, in earthquakes, I think that um, bouncing back to what we had before is not uh, the best uh, way to uh, describe resiliency of our designs. It's rather bouncing forward to something better. And how would we do that? Um, we, are, we are, I think, using the term of life safety, which is a cornerstone of building codes to this day. A, a, as um, I think a term that could be misinterpreted as providing resiliency at large. So life safety um, in building codes really means no loss of life after an earthquake, which means that the building can give you the opportunity to get out of it alive. This does not ensure functionality of the building. It does not even ensure that this building will not be demolished after you get out. So this addresses your immediate life safety, but it does not address if you're going to bounce forward to something better because it does not address what I call life quality of, or how your life is going to change after this extreme event. So the concept of, um, of performance-based design is something that we have been using and extensively in recent years in earthquake engineering. And we're looking at performance of structural components depending on the level of an, of an earthquake. But how can we migrate from that to uh, something that includes life quality or um, bigger big picture goals? Uh, that would be uh, looking at functional recovery. And functional recovery, I will talk more about it. It should involve interconnected systems, interdependencies. For example, you are building a very well uh, designed hospital, but a bridge that takes you to that hospital has to be operable in order for you to reach with your patients the hospital after an earthquake. Also hazards and cascading hazards, interdependent hazards, and I'll talk through a video about that, uh, but also have an understanding of the state of our assets, where we are in the life cycle with um, lifelong monitoring that can collect data to help us calibrate 
models that we have and reevaluate our risk landscape through this data and new knowledge and new tools that we have. And trying to incorporate measures for earthquake protection to regular maintenance in order to give a business value and get funding diverted to that, especially in areas where people are not so convinced that earthquake is in their horizon. And um, so um, the, um, the, the, the usual engineering terminology for resilience um, is, um, uh, is, the, is through the US um, presidential policy directive. Uh, that uh, talks about the ability to prepare, adapt to changing conditions, with, uh, withstand and recover rapidly uh, from uh, disruptions. And that includes earthquakes. Um, unfortunately, this term uh, you know, has been uh, used extensively with different ways. And I think uh, there is some confusion, even the people who um, first incorporated um, the term in engineering uh, design frameworks. Um, uh, Michelle Bruno and Andre Reinhorn, um, who was my PhD uh, co-advisor actually, um, have a concern that this could become a foundation of a new bubble tower where everybody's talking, and, and but they mean a different thing with the same word. So uh, I think a more uh, engineering oriented and a more, um, Easy, an easier to adapt and an easier to communicate uh, term, although it's not the same, um, is the functional recovery concept. Uh, there has been a report that I would uh, encourage you to take a look at um, that presents a national framework for um, functional recovery of uh, buildings and infrastructure lifeline uh, systems. And it's available online um, through the NIST uh, website or the FEMA website. The, the project was co-funded by the two federal agencies. Um, and I had the pleasure of being, before joining NIST on working on this as uh, within the experts um, that composed that document. Um, so functional recovery for the built environment is the link between design, construction, or retrofit of individual assets and community resilience. So instead of, of jumping from individual structural um, and design to this big picture of how our communities could be resilient, here is a link between the two, which is the functional recovery goals in addition to life safety. Um, so this is more engineered, more relied on standards that we are trying to develop. Uh, some of them are, are in the works and depend less on the big picture resiliency planning. And they are addressing more individual uh, systems of buildings or lifelines rather than the whole community, uh, which is uh, another step to this. So um, if I was asked to describe an example of functional recovery, an example of true resilience of a building, I think that I would use um, the, uh, the park definition about uh, what does an engineering system do rather than what this system has. And I will explain more about what that means through um, an example, and that example is this building that you see on the screen. That's the Torre Mayor Tower in the heart of Mexico City, in one of the worst areas that you can design for earthquakes, uh, because it's in the middle of the former lake where Mexico City um, is mostly founded in. Uh, but also it has major earthquakes and winds and floods. So uh, this was the first project I had worked on as a, a consultant. And um, I, it, 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 um, it has these diamond shape um, uh, dampers that you can see, they look very beautiful actually, uh, but they were a very unique innovative solution 
um, that was created where the dampers have the ability to function both for earthquakes and for wind. And um, the building went in operations in year 2000. So it has sustained many earthquakes since then. It, has, it was the first building and the tallest building in Latin America until a few years ago. And the first building in Mexico that was designed with performance-based design criteria. So it has performed extremely well. The developer is, is um, a big company that, that has their offices in there. So every time there is an earthquake, we call up and ask if the building is okay. And uh, we had in 2017, a major earthquake in Mexico, the Puebla Morelos earthquake. So we called up the, the developers to see uh, how the building did. And they told us oh, that the building did fine as always. Uh, you know, the dampers, what they do is, is, is they push in the opposite direction of, of what the load is. So you are supposed not to feel anything. So they didn't feel anything. However, they saw dust uh, from damage on from the windows. And they said that the major problem they had is that they had many people that were walking outside that ran for shelter into, a build, into the building because they, are, are, they know that this is a safe place for earthquakes because its resiliency has been proven. So it's it, what this, this building does, it's not what it has. So um, if you have ever been in an earthquake, it's extremely scary. And for me that I have been in a couple of big ones, the last place I would want to be is inside a building, especially when there is a park across the street that you can run and have no, no risk uh, the way I see it. But it proves what a good jo job the building has done in advertising itself. So I think that is a proof of a resilient structure. And I think that um, we as engineers can do a better job uh, in quotes, bragging about what we do, because that creates trust. And a communication message of trust is so important in what we do in trying to make things better through engineering. And also to do a good, better job in understanding and conveying the message that investment in technologies and investment in innovation pays back multiple times the investment of doing it. So um, what, how do we go about uh, building more resiliently and incorporating functional recovery? Uh, it is obviously um, quite, um, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite more abstract than, than uh, designing pres prescriptively. But there are the four R's that you need to think of when you are, let's, let's say, um, responding from an earthquake. So if you start from your response, you want to recover, you want to have a risk reduction measures for to be ready, so develop readiness uh, for the next one where you have to respond again and the cycle would start again. There are also the four R's of quantifying resiliency uh, which have to do with robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness, and rapidity that relate to all these four R's that I'm showing. So robustness would be, um, for lack of better words, stronger or inherent strength that can take the demands of the earthquake. Redundancy is alternative options to take that, that load. And um, resourcefulness would be the capacity to mobilize alternative resources and services that can help you in emergencies. And rapidity would be the speed with which you can overcome your um, uh, disruption. So um, why do we need to do that? And what is the driver behind um, the functional recovery concept and how could all of this contribute to um, a resilient nation? So um, the fact is that frequency of extreme events and their destructiveness have increased dramatically. Um, this is an example of the 2016 Ecuador earthquake. This is a picture from our mission in uh, 
um, in in the country back in 2006 uh, with um, GEAR and ATC, uh, where um, we saw in that particular year, I, this was the worst year in global economic losses from natural disaster. Um, and um, sadly, moving forward with the years, every year practically proved to be uh, worse than the other one. And by a factor of more than 50% increase in reinsurer losses. So reinsurers are the big insurances that insure the small insurances. So when you look at reports from them, like uh, Swiss reinsurance or Zurich reinsurance and other reinsurers, you can tell what is the trend for losses. Um, and um, um, this is not getting much better, especially considering the effects of climate change. And um, uh, what we have learned from all these extreme events, this is an example from Hurricane Sandy in New York City back in 2012, is that um, the downtime or the loss of functionality can create significantly worse financial loss and local effects, but also global effects. So just an example is that um, um, that, that uh, other than the financial damage of uh, $70 billion in, in Sandy, uh, we can also uh, think of what shutting down the, Walmart, the Wall Street market, uh, the financial center of the world for a few days uh, did globally. And of course, um, another um, unfortunate sad fact is that um, uh, smaller events um, that are more frequent uh, do not mean less damage or less life lost. And um, uh, the, um, in 2018, which really could be unremarkable in terms of um, uh, natural catastrophes. There was no major earthquake. Um, there was no major, major event. Uh, but what we had is um, major losses from uh, the um, uh, wildfires. And what you see here is an image of the before in the campfire in uh, California and the after. Uh, with um, uh, with very few buildings, just what you see in this GIS map as the white buildings are the ones that were able to survive this massive um, fire. Um, so what 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 do we um, learn from uh, this unremarkable from and and natural uh, um, occurrence of uh, hazards in that year? is that we had uh, a tremendous amount of lives lost, 13,500, and um, the fourth highest ever payout in re reinsurance losses. So what is happening? Why, why is that? Why did this happen if there was no major, major event? Um, it is the new norm that we live in. It, it has to do that with, um, uh, our extreme weather, which is partially related to climate change, and also the higher frequency, more localized events create a new norm of um, uh, more people being exposed. And more people is a growth of urbanization that is tremendous. It's a driver for um, increasing our risk. And uh, we can see that um, an increase of 80% by uh, year 2100. Um, and just looking at more than half of the increase by 2030 makes us build in areas or expand in areas that make us more vulnerable uh, to earthquakes or create larger concentration of people on areas that uh, could be more susceptible to um, effects from earthquakes. So um, irrespective of the climate change, what 
was once a localized event. Let's say you build on, you know, waterfront that has never been used just for, you know, uh, uh, boardwalks. And now it has become residential. You are exposing people to what used to be an area that was not occupied by people. So uh, this is something that we should be very mindful about. And there is a lot to be discussed about, you know, climate change, about, um, you know, these, uh, these wildfires where you, we are building in interfaces between wildlife and developed areas. And this, when the event passes, creates a more vulnerable environment to any hazard, including earthquakes. So we are all in this together. We are not separated from the other hazards. And that's a big challenge for you guys who are starting, who will start your career soon. So in that, um, and, uh, communication is key. And one of the studies we are doing right now has to do with how communication worked or did not work in Hurricane Maria, for example. Uh, but even between us, right, um, I'm somewhere between a geotechnical and a structural engineer. Um, uh, but, you know, we, we as structural and geotechnical engineers don't, don't always uh, connect well, most of the times I would think, unfortunately. So communication is key. This is an image from um, the, uh, an earthquake in uh, Cephalonia in Greece in 2014. Uh, where we had a mission with ERI and GEAR and ATC. And there was massive liquefaction in the ports of this island. And you see me being fascinated about the lateral spread and damage to the pier here, while my colleague, who is a structural engineer, Ramon Gilsons, is fascinated by these boats that had uh, toppled. So um, he was saying that he was looking at something uh, more interesting. Uh, but I think conveying risk concepts to the public is very important. And it's also very important to you as new professionals to focus on your written and verbal communication skills. It is so important in your career that I cannot emphasize more about how big of a problem that is um, when you, um, how, how much of a good it would be for you if you would invest on your communication skills. So when I go to, and I talk a lot to public schools about earthquake uh, hazard and risk prevention, and they are asking me when um, I'm in New York, they're asking, you know, um, you know, but do we have earthquakes here? And I said, yeah, we do have earthquakes here, but they are rare and they're not as big as the earthquakes that we expect in, in the West Coast, but we do have them. But we also have a very good, uh, strong building code for new buildings. And um, uh, this, this, um, this code uh, considers an earthquake that can happen once in 2,500 years. So when the parents hear that, they're very happy because once in 2,500 years seems like so rare compared to the concept of a hundred year flood, which is what they are used to. So they're like, oh, this, you know, it's very rare. Uh, but then I tell them that uh, what that means is that um, uh, this earthquake in the life of this building, in the 50 year, let's say life of the building, we are 98% sure that it's not going to happen. So I said, and they are not that happy with that because they, they want this number to be 99.9% uh, sure. I said, but yeah, but it's the same number. It's one in 2,500 years, right? And then when things become really bad is when I tell them, well, that means it could happen at any point in time. And if it happens today, the clock starts again and it could happen at any point in time in a window of 2,500 years. So I think going back to my concept of false sense of security is that the way we communicate things and sometimes the message may not be pleasant, but it has to be truthful and it has to be consistent in order for all of us to move forward um, is to convey our message. So I'll, I'll show you an example of how important visualization is uh, as a means of conveying a message to the public. I hope you can see the video. 
that I'm showing. If, if not, let me know. Uh, so this is a simulation that you will see that led to decision making about um, a viaduct um, in the area of Seattle, the Alaskan Way viaduct. And um, there were a lot of discussions about um, uh, creating, uh, about retrofitting the viaduct or creating tunnels or other solutions. So what you will see this video is uh, composed by many aero photographs. It's quite an old video. It was prepared by Parsons Bringerhof Technical Excellence Center uh, where I, I used to work. And um, it has a simulation based on actual analysis of all the nodes that you see on this bridge with the actual Nisqually earthquake stretched a little bit in time, but still yet realistic as an, a design level or maximum earthquake, where you see how the bridge, how the viaduct is moving, but also you start seeing the associated events, the associated effects of the earthquake with lifelines, with looking at the gas pipelines, the highways, collapses, lateral spread and of course uh, liquefaction and as you can see um, in the gas pipeline systems the unfortunate effects that we typically have after an earthquake that of a fire is also goes on and on and on the only thing you don't see is damage to the buildings inland and that's because these were not modeled but the modeling of the earthquake response is an actual um, analysis that had been peer reviewed by the University of Washington. And this video made a difference that tons in weight of reports did not make on what to do about this viaduct in conveying a very scary message, yet a truthful message about the extent of the problem for a design level earthquake. And I think that right now there is a tunnel in place uh, there. The decision was made for a tunnel. So um, in the path uh, to resilience, learning from earthquakes, um, as I described from the study program of ERI, uh, but also using technologies and visualization is very important. And um, this is uh, some of the events I had I had the, um, the opportunity to be involved in. And I'm going to show you um, visualization, which is also a real 3D uh, model that can help you do analysis after earthquakes. So in the Ecuador earthquake that I described earlier, there was uh, thousands and thousands of drone images that were provided to us when we went there. Um, and they were not yet, the drones were not yet regulated. So we took the images back to the Technical Excellence Center and created, which created for us um, a 3D model that helped us in something that is very, very hard to do by hand, um, no matter how much data you have in an earthquake. That is to analyze and cut sections of landslides. So in Ecuador, there was a major landslide that was unfortunately created from the earthquake, but the unfortunate part other than the earthquake was that there, was, there were days of rain prior to that, that made the soil saturated and more vulnerable to these landslides. So there was a triple, um, a, a three-step landslide. What you see on the, on the image on the left is how the area was before the earthquake and how the landslide evolved after the earthquake, but there was an initial uplift um, and um, um, and um, uh, as, uh, the first landslide was a lateral movement at the top and which created an uplift at the base of, of the slope. And this followed um, with uh, a rotation settlement uh, as a second phase and a, and a major uh, massive landslide as the third step. So what we did is we took um, 
images of the existing conditions from Google Earth that were available. This is the before. And then we took all these images and created um, the, the screening and created um, and, and a matching of a cloud of pictures that were compatible in order to create a 3D model of um, uh, the, the after um, uh, conditions through the drones. And what we did is created basically a DM, a digital elevation model that we were able to overlay in the uh, Google map of the before. So what you see as more transparent is the before, what you see as darker is the after. So what is important about that is that it's a true live model that can be used to um, create uh, volumetric calculations. Um, so what you can do is through a very simple, relatively simple 3D CAD um, um, programmable, uh, programmable um, software, uh, you can easily draw a section and then immediately you would have the slope um, and the volumes lost. Combined with records that we had nearby, this made it tremendously easier to analyze and understand the slope instability. Whereas by hand, you would be able to draw, draw a couple of, of sections instead of so many that, that you could do and learn from. So the most important, I think, learn, learning from earthquakes activity that we need to do better in terms of resiliency observations is things that worked versus things that got damaged or destroyed. And we are all as engineers attracted to, to the damage and the disaster and understand why things failed. But you know why this minaret in Turkey that you see here in the 1999 earthquake remained intact um, while everything else, including new construction around it failed um, is something to learn from, uh, whether it was frequency or whatever made it resilient, right? And um, um, with examples like that, uh, we have started this idea and in trying to validate standards by collecting data of good performance or end of bad performance. This is an example of an ATC mission to Mexico City after the Puebla Morelos, but focusing only on non-ductile buildings to validate the FEMA P218 uh, project. So we collected data of ground motions, geotech, design, observations. We even did micro tremor instrumentation measures in, um, in selected buildings, but the data set that we collected was from 70 buildings uh, that has started a series of studies that can validate with real performance data um, these uh, major um, efforts. So, um, if we, if we change our mind into things that worked and why they worked, maybe uh, we can put a stop into the, you know, the fancy analysis and go back a little bit to the basics. And that's very, very important when we look at life quality. And there have been older uh, codes that, the first code that I know of uh, in a national scale that talked about earthquake, um, protection is that, um, that it's really um, the probability of failure and casualties that is of concern. So, and they brought the concept of the hazard versus the risk, but also the distribution of the hazard, where you may have a map that shows you red somewhere, right? That you have very high expectations of, of ground accelerations, but, if no people, no, nobody's living there, then you know the life safety will automatically be uh, satisfied because there are no people there. So um, there are a lot of um, lessons to be learned, and this is a very important lesson that was learned organically in California. What you see here is an earthquake in uh, Santa Barbara in 1925 that triggered. Um, generation of codes actually in the West Coast. And um, it, it, one of the 
of the damages that happened is the a dam um, uh, collapsed and there was um, release of a lot of water. Now, what happened there is remarkable. There was um, a gas from the gas public company um, operator, an engineer went and shut off the gas supply for the whole city, which prevented fires, which would be the obvious um, expectations. And why he did that is because he had memories of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake that of course is very much associated to major uh, fires that created practically the destruction of the whole city. The other, um, going back to, to basics, um, uh, um, uh, I think, um, uh, advice would be to respect nature and to do a thorough job in reviewing historic data and understanding uh, conditions. So this is an example of the in the Chichi uh, earthquake in Taiwan um, uh, of a bridge that was designed to code, but uh, probably the, there was no uh, geotechnical investigation or it, it was not thoroughly, um, uh, the geology was not well understood. This would be probably the worst location to choose to put a bridge right through an active fault, uh, which is very hard to protect from. And then the multi-hazards is, uh, you know, we cannot just think earthquakes. We have to understand how uh, other, um, hazards could be affected by what we do. And this is um, the logic of raising buildings for flood protection is an obvious measure that kind of follows the next flood level uh, versus um, what would that do to an earthquake? That is a multi-million dollar home uh, that is going to be very safe in a big flood. But as uh, you know, or you will learn from uh, your earthquake classes, it is the worst case for an earthquake because it creates that lollipop and what we call soft story and very weak uh, bottom floor that could be detrimental for that building. So um, how can we connect all these dots of innovation, of new performance objectives, and create um, uh, frameworks to work with as designers is um, a, a big challenge. And there are efforts like the one from the Federal Highway Administration to bring it all together for transportation systems, where transportation infrastructure resilience, we want it to be part or lead to life quality, but it has uh, different pillars, some of which have to do with how we, how the agencies talk to each other and the local versus the, the state or the federal agencies. How uh, can we adapt and operate, which has to do with operations and also the, the uh, what they call the maturity of the agencies to, uh, to adapt something like that. How do we collect data and how do we build a national database of resilient behavior and how do we achieve functionality, which is the most structural part of what I'm showing here. Um, and there, these, these pillars branch out to all these indices and quantifiers that can help us navigate through what is the best to invest on. So just to talk a little bit about life safety versus life quality again, because of that I think is a major takeaway that I would love for you to take uh, from this presentation. This is a building in Christchurch, New, New Zealand that as you know, has sustained a series of major earthquakes in 2010, 2011. And this is a residential house that Professor Bray from Berkeley monitored throughout these earthquakes. And this is an example of life safety being satisfied by code. And what you will see is the first earthquake, 2010, this building was, was life safety was satisfied, uh, but there was liquefaction. So there was a lot of water. And what you see here is the evidence of a surface manifestation of the liquefaction. The owner cleaned the, the space there, but then the next earthquake happened in February, 2011. So there was even more liquefaction effects that happened. 
life safety was still satisfied. The owner thought that if he puts pavers down, he's going to hold the, the, the soil down, uh, which was not uh, true in the April earthquake. So uh, you can only imagine what happens inside that house, how much water and, and mess that, that uh, and disruption this caused. And um, then he cleaned it up again. And the first part of the June earthquake happened, more liquefaction, and then massive liquefaction in part two. So a uh, life quality here is a major issue. And especially if I tell you the following, that these owners have by law insurance, both for floods and for earthquakes. And for at least a period of five to six years, these owners could not get any reimbursement from these insurances because they went to the earthquake insurance and they said, oh, your damage is water induced. So go to the, uh, the flood insurance. And the flood said, well, the earthquake created that problem. So go to the earthquake insurance. So there was a, a ping pong situation between the two um, insurance types. And not to mention that now this house is in a flood zone that was not before. So it has lost probably a lot of its value. So life safety had been and has been satisfied for this, but life quality is not. So if we try to expand on these pillars that I showed as an example of how we could set up a big picture um, framework, where of course each one of us will, will only be able to handle a few of these steps is, um, uh, let's let's try to focus, let's say, on the functionality that I, I tried to say that this is more structural. So the functionality could have, um, uh, could be quantified by robustness, resourceful, and serability, which was some of the R's that I mentioned in the beginning. And um, this, I think, would be the closest to uh, structural um, elements that we can discuss. So if we were to take these three quantifiers, then these can have a lot of different indices that could be part of the TOSE, which is TOSE is the, the original, um, they call it the people's framework that have T is technical, um, O is o, o, econo, a, operational, and S and E are so, social economic factors. So all of these include a lot of structural aspects, especially in the technical, but we have to also consider, for example, how easy is it to implement? How, what happens with interdependency? These are operational issues. Um, rapidly, we have to look at functional recovery um, and the response time and what that means, not only to these components, but to a whole network of a highway, right? So um, again, the, the needs for that are, are presented in the, um, in the report. It's not last week, it, it was in, I think late January or early February, and it has been provided to Congress uh, as an urgent need uh, to update our uh, standards to move towards functional recovery goals. Um, uh, so um, uh, with that, uh, the, I will repeat that functional recovery is the link between design, construction, and retrofit, and depends more on standards for individual components of the big community resilience pictures. So with that, I hope I am more or less in, within time. And I want to talk about the needs and challenges that I think it is... Um, very difficult problems ahead of us, but very exciting uh, for you to focus on and look at what, what the recommendations are from this report and how you can contribute to a more resilient um, set of standards and, and, the, and a country, the, our country and the world at large is the, the, the focus on, on the recommendations is that we need a functional recovery framework uh, overall that would cover both buildings and lifeline infrastructure. And lifelines could be highways, could be water supply system, 
uh, supply chain issues and all that. So we want to set recovery based objective, not just performance, but time objectives. And I'll move maybe to just a visual that is an expansion of what we were talking about life safety. You see life safety is this is will give you the chance of get, uh, getting out of it alive, right? And we had the concept of reoccupancy, but also we wanna move further into functional recovery. Functional recovery means not only that your building is structurally safe, but you can have electricity, you can have, you can use a toilet, you have water, and otherwise you cannot occupy. Um, so the questions become, would these goals of time would be um, like similar to the risk categories that we have in building codes, we would have things that would have to be immediately operable versus months. And how could all, all these interdependencies be accounted for in that case? Um, but also, um, what is more important than what in different hazards. So this framework that I showed was developed for earthquakes. I think the concepts are identical if you look at any hazard, but th there is a lot of conversation about the, should these return times be a fixed uh, number regardless of the hazard type. And there is a lot to be said about that and I'd be happy to discuss this with you. So for I think for your challenges, uh, one thing that, that we can all keep in mind that moving towards resilience, uh, resilience uh, resiliency is a choice. And it's a choice that um, uh, probably it's a one-way street at this point, especially considering the very, um, very uh, tight deadlines we have imposed from our planet getting warmer and warmer. And we know that the, the with the gaps we have to fill in our aged infrastructure, it is a race against time. So, um, but we know that this investment pays off. There are studies and there is a recent FEMA report about building codes and investment versus return. So that's a good argument to make. And um, I think a general um, guiding principle is that we all as uh, civil engineers Eventually, we are working not for a company, not for an agency. We work for the civil, uh, the, the public. And we need to, to understand that we have a social responsibility to ensure not only life safety, um, but also prevent earthquakes from uh, becoming disasters and, and to look at life quality at large, thinking out of the box, learning from the past, using innovation, but also using common sense and basic engineering principles and, and look up to, to the vast knowledge that we have collected. And I think choosing the path of earthquake engineering is um, a very timely these days because of the leadership in these developments uh, that can be adapted in other hazards and um, can give you the opportunity to innovate and develop big picture uh, frameworks and improve um, our standards. So with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and your patience, and particular thanks to uh, the University of Minnesota and the ERI student chapter for the opportunity to present my views. And, um, uh, uh, the, my contact is available to you for uh, continuing you know, this conversation other than the question and answer. And my um, wish for you is to never think um, inside the box. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Stacey, for the presentation. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Mm. Um, I believe if you guys have questions for uh, Professor Cece, can you please uh, go ahead, you can ask them. I think I have a few questions, but uh, uh, yeah, do you have time for have one or two questions? Of course, yes. 
Yeah, so for the simulation about the bridge that you present, uh, what kind of simulation was that? Is this something like structural simulation or is a combination of a lot of simulation? Or... So this was a dynamic model for the bridge that had, uh, you know, it was a dynamic nonlinear model of the bridge that was analyzed for the particular earthquake. So what, what they did to create the animation is they took different nodes and from these nodes, they took the time history of the response. And then they were able to insert that into the, uh, the 3D AutoCAD model to show the movement. And the same for the lateral spread, it was liquefaction analysis. And they, I, I don't know all the details, but it, it is an actual dynamic analysis using the stretched uh, record of the Nisqually earthquake. Yeah. And the second question is about the uh, data visualization. Uh, so right now, are there any framework for doing the job of data visualization of something like the, the, the after effect of the earthquake and think oh it is more like um case specific work that uh, uh well it is not specified but what i i have seen um is that first of all it doesn't take much time and effort if you have qualified people doing that um what i have seen there are two things one is there are needs to do rapid construction on site, not for earthquake specifically, but to make sure that everything is in place and you see this rapid replacement of bridges or embankments. So this is used for that. And the other um, place where it's used is to convince contractors that go for directly for design build type of um, work to visualize the, the uh, order of things, the time evolution of how I'm going to excavate, where I'm going to put this, where I'm going to put that. The particular example, which I was not part of, but I, um, I have been discussing was that there was a need to show, because it was so technical, the content, and so concentrated on one thing or the other thing, it was an effort to show like big picture what, what could happen. And I think that is so important. It is so important and you cannot codify that, um, but recent major proposals have been asked to be submitted visually because people don't like to open anymore a big report and, and read it. So they're asking, you have to tell us a story, you know, similar to how the architects present their model and what the model would do and all that. And, when you have this demand, the special specialization on understanding and, and being able to do this analysis, but also to visualize it, uh, it's going to be very important. And the more, is, as I said, the more we push for things and the more we can incorporate these things, the better these things are going to be adapted as the standard of the practice. The the downside to this is who pays for that. So if you are in research and development, <clears throat> this could be part of what you're developing. But in practice, it's very hard to justify it unless if it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. And we have to do a better job to say this is necessary because you're going to invest on that. But your model is going to be used, for example, for maintenance. It's going to be used to, to have, um, a, you know, a data acquisition systems that you can see in real time what's going on. It's going to be an investment that will pay off. Mm -hmm. So we need to have these conversations and the know-how. Yeah, okay. So, and my last question is about the uh, functional recovery. So uh, I think people are moving forward on adapt, ad, adapting those functional recovery into like design standards. So do you have any idea on maybe a possible time frame when the target recovery time will become something like a, a, a 
a standard for designing? So the the issue is um, that we need the these quantifiers, or we need we have the the framework and. The, the, we don't want to have like a confusion about these things. And it's very, very hard to make it into standards. So what I understand is that there, there is work that has been extended now, focusing on particular types, let's say, of lifelines that provide water. And water is complicated because water, wastewater, fire, uh, extinction water, etc. Um, and and they are different uh, animals. And the challenge is that we have used to the concepts of fragilities. So fragilities is um, functions that you develop through different simulations or experiments that connect a key parameter of the earthquake to performance. So for buildings, we have a lot of those in, there is a, a program FEMA P58 that has, has to do with um, such objectives for buildings. So it can connect not only damage, let's say you connect the peak ground acceleration to a drift between stories, but also it can give you predictions for death, injuries, downtime, because these have been calibrated. The challenge that I see as a major technical challenge is that in lifelines and distributed systems, you cannot easily define this parameter and you cannot easily define the performance because it's a distributed, imagine a pipe, you know, there are correlations to the to movements of faults to a damage, but how operable, and, and these are very hard things to quantify, how much a fault is going to move is a very seismological difficult thing to quantify, right? So it's not a PGA that you can take from a hazard map and go to, to a performance. And then how much, you know, per, how much supply I'm going to have through that it's not the same as a structure. So the concept of fragility could be adapted differently for other systems. And these other systems, I think, have stayed behind in that game because there was a lot more effort in the buildings. But a building, if it doesn't have water, is not going to operate. So we, it's a, it's a, a balance that, that we need to look at as a building more as, a, as an alive thing that has all these different parts to it. And there are, there are fragilities for non-structural components, but not of how the system that supplies your building is going to behave. So I, it is something that we need to think when we're thinking of functionality, yeah. right? So there are there the field is so open right now, and it's a great great opportunity to uh, to be involved. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for answering a lot of questions. Uh, so we, I guess we are. Uh, haven't got many people left, but uh, yeah. yeah. Do we have any other questions? We have uh, Anu who is with us. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead. Okay, I think we, um, that's it for the questions. Uh, Dr. Sethi, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and for giving us part of your time. And um, we're very sorry about the inconvenience that happened. It's um, it's always something goes bad. <laughs> so yeah, I'd be so happy to, to uh, stay in touch uh, with the others that um, may have questions and discuss also the experiences of 
um, you know, local chapters and how these can start. And, you know, also if you are thinking of committees and you would like more insight about how you can match your interests to what ERI has to offer in terms of involvement. Um, um, Ahmed has my contact information and I think you can distribute it to anybody interested and don't, uh, don't feel uh, shy about reaching out and um, you know where to find me now. <laughs> That's great. We also have recorded this uh, lecture, so I'm going to send you a copy of the recording so you can share it with uh, the faculty members and the students that couldn't make it today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you for much. organizing this. I hope next time we will meet in person. Yeah, I hope that as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.